All right, all you people, get inside here. If you didn't get your cinnamon roll, get you one. We've got all kinds of goodies back there. Come on. Those of you that are tuning in online, get tuned in tonight. I doubt we're going to top what we did last week or what God did last week. We actually had 14 weeks of church in one night. I thought we could take about three months off. I thought we were caught up. But for those of you that weren't here, I don't know how many people got a touch from God up here and healed and whatnot. A whole pile of them. We baptized seven or eight of them right off the cuff last week. Um, nobody brought swimming trunks or towels or anything else. So now you know you're you're doing something. So our God's doing something. We really don't do anything. Uh, Jim Murphy and I were talking about it today at the cow sale. He said, what's your plan tonight? I said, I don't have one. He said, if I show up, you want me to bring a guitar? And I said, yeah, that'd be great. But I'm telling you, the days of me having a plan are over. We've been doing this without a plan now for a long time. And uh, we're seeing how that works. And uh, did you girls ever write that down? All right, I'll get it during the singing. I'll get it so we can do that. Hey, uh, but anyhow, just not have a plan and just follow however God wants to go. And, you know, we know on Wednesday nights we're going to be here, Tuesday morning we're going to be here, Sunday morning we're going to be here. But other than that, kind of know where I am in the Scriptures. But, but that just telling God every day you get together, hey, God, just so you know, this is how I'm going to do this today. And uh, just so you know, God, here's my calendar, and this is how I'm going to do it for the next six months. Uh, that that's I did that. That's probably not. This is sure working better. Not knowing what the heck you're doing uh, really works better. I uh, went to San Diego uh, Monday. We uh, just to catch everybody up right quick. Last Thursday, yeah, after we got done here Wednesday night, we went to Austin. And so here again, right off the cuff, I mean, y'all kind of know the story. We, 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 God just opened the door for us to walk right in the state capitol to have a, a room. The timing was absolutely perfect. Everybody had left. The house was swept clean. Now, if anybody knows your Bible, you'll know what that means. That house was swept clean. The opportunity to invade that premises with the kingdom of God was wide open. We didn't know when we set that up that the governor was going to have an emergency session, and they all got called back in on that Saturday. So we had this whole vacant capital, so to speak, on, fr on Friday, and then everybody came back. There was 44 or 45 people showed up from all over the place. We had people from here, people from all over Texas, and New Mexico showed up about 45 ahead of us, and we prayed for two solid hours without a plan, without an agenda, and God began to move in men and women around there and began to give words and began to pray, and we used up our entire time. I, I don't know if anybody thought it was a waste of time. I hadn't heard from them yet, but everybody else, it was uh, pretty cotton-picking awesome. And so we turn around and come back, and I jumped on an airplane and went to San Diego. Yeah, and uh, and 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 you know what? How many of you, how many of you Texans have had any preconceived notions about Southern California? Do you know where I saw the most weirdos on that trip? DFW Airport. <laughs> yep, I mean they were grotesque. The FW Airport was grotesque. Southern California, San Diego, that was as clean and as normal and as American as any place as I've been. And, uh, and I learned something while I was there. It was another one of those deals. I didn't know anybody involved. I get a phone call from a couple guys that want to put a horse sale on in Southern California. There's a guy there that has bought this amazing facility in Temecula, California, and uh, I've never met him in my life, never met them guys wanting to do a horse sale. Uh, 
for the last months I have turned down every opportunity that's come my way because we've had other things to do. And these guys call, and I've told her, I said, I don't know what the heck, but I'm going to go to California. We're going to take a look. And so we get out there. Well, you all know my face South Dakota story where airplanes got canceled. I'll just be real honest with you. While I'm driving 11, I'm supposed to catch that very same flight. 6.10 Monday morning, I'm supposed to be flying. So 4 o'clock in the morning, I'm leaving town. The whole time over, I'm thinking, God, I hope they cancel this flight. <laughs> and I'll just turn around and go home, and life will be normal. I don't know these guys nothing. I'll just turn around and go back. I get off the airplane in San Diego, and these guys have been blowing my phone up. Their flights got canceled. So now the guys that are supposed to pick me up at the airport and show me around, the guys are supposed to be hiring me, the guys are bought my plane ticket. They ain't coming. <laughs> so I'm standing there in my cowboy hat in San Diego, and anyhow, the guy that owned the property, he he just come got me, and we'd never met, and we became friends over two days. Everybody that works at that ranch there, I we either knew each other personally or we knew everybody around each other. Come to find out, I knew all the history of it used to be an amazing cutting horse facility and blah blah blah. So I had a I had a wonderful time. And by the time we got done, we we're still talking about having a horse sale. But by the time we're headed to the airport, we're trying to figure out how to have some type of cowboy church service. Come to find out, there's a ton of coffee with the colonel people in Southern California, and uh, it turned into a really cool time. Here again. It's just about making kingdom connections. You don't go places. In the kingdom of God, you don't go places just to make money. Because in my life, you don't know if you're going to make any or not. But you go by the leading of the Holy Spirit to where you find these kingdom connections. You see, every one of you is a kingdom connection. If you're born again... You're a kingdom connection. This is where we're so screwed up in this country and in the church because we, we count the kingdom of God as something else and we're not involved in it now. But the kingdom's involved in us. So somebody may walk through your door to find their way to Jesus or find their need or whatever it is they got going on and uh, to be that kingdom person. So through all this mess we've been in, and then Robin and I traveling around the country, if we've learned anything, it's the kingdom connections. So we, we have a real hard time saying no to people now because that might be a kingdom connection. I have some kingdom connections now in Southern California. That, that's a good thing. So one of these days when Christians finally figure this out you'll realize that there's more of us than there are them this little small group of people that act like the governor of New Mexico or the governor of New of, of, of California we're getting a new governor of New York praise the Lord I mean, you couldn't get worse, so it's got to go up. But this little group, I was thinking about George Soros this morning. I mean, honest to God, he's the sorriest human being that ever drawed a breath on the face of the earth. I mean, he is a total advocate for Satan himself. Doesn't believe there's a God. He's a God. Got a lot of money. But I'll make a bet with you today. I'll bet you if you'll take all his assets, all his money, and put it in a pile, and if you could get all of us kingdom connections to show up on the same day, and put all our stuff in a pile, I'll bet you our sandbox is fuller than his. There's not one thing this little minute group of people have that we don't have or we don't have access to. But now there's a lot that we have 
that they don't have. You see, the enemy comes first to steal. Anybody feel like you've been robbed of anything in the last 18 months? Maybe even the last 18 years. And then he's going to kill. How many of you ever felt like he's trying to kill your Christian faith? How many of you ever feel like there's an entity out there that wants to kill Christianity in America today? Yeah. You see, if he can steal off you long enough that he can kill your faith, then he'll destroy your nation. But the first thing he's going to do is destroy your kitchen table. Anybody seen any of that go on in the last two decades? Yeah. But what I'm figuring out while we're dropping off out of airplanes and parking campers and stuff all over the country, there is a pile of us. The kingdom connections, they're everywhere. Everywhere. Why in the world would a group of Christians trip over their lip or cow down or pretend to be a doormat or a, that Christian bobblehead, you know, turn the other cheek till your head comes off. You know, what they do, you just finally come together and say, look, we love y'all, but we ain't moving. We're not changing our ideals. We're not changing our thoughts. We're going to educate our own kids. We're educate our own kids. Floyd, New Mexico is fighting a big fight. The whole state of New Mexico is going to be fighting it before it's over. Let me tell you something, Texas. I've been all over the country, and the biggest pile of weirdos you'll find is right here in Texas now. You'll find people that are absolutely downright disgusting right here in your own state. So don't get too haughty about who you are as a bunch of Texans. We all got it coming but I'm going to tell you right now there's nobody nobody can tell you how to educate your children unless you need somebody else to pay for your shoulder pads somebody else to pay for your coaching staff somebody else to pay for your weight room or your cheerleading bus see if you need somebody to pay for all the extras and you're probably going to have to let somebody else handle the reading, writing, and arithmetic. Today, you're going to take care of your own stuff. So I was explaining this to a group of people today, us rodeo people, we get it. Because we bought our own practice uniforms. <laughs> we bought our own gas. We, pay, we built our own playing fields. We've tended our own. So we get that. But if you need Pharaoh's billfold, just know you're going to have a hard time unhooking from Pharaoh. And the church is falling in the same trap because they don't want to get in trouble by Pharaoh, so they guard their tongue and guard their messages and guard their actions. They'll guard their pews in case somebody would walk out of here and the coffers would seem to deplete just a tick. Let me tell you right now, you're not my source. God Almighty is my source. And He'll take care of my education, my recreation, and everything in between. So, one of these days when we pile up, and we all stand up, say, you know what? I think we're just going to tend to what's ours. You'll look around one of these days, and you'll realize what's ours amounts into way more than what somebody else's. Those of us who belong to the kingdom of God, we've been given everything necessary for life and godliness. And if you'll seek ye first that kingdom and his righteousness, everything will be added to you. We've just got to unify. And we're not divided by state. We shouldn't even be divided by denomination or anything else. We should be unified by one faith, one spirit, one baptism because of one God. And when we do that, really? Now, who's going to gang up against us? And what uncircumcised Philistine just wants to yap his flap at a bunch of people in covenant with God? 
So my trip to Southern California, my trip to Austin, which, by the way, I was right next to the ocean. You know what I saw next to the ocean in San Diego? Big stinking boats. They got big stinking boats. I'm talking about big boats. Yeah. I mean, you got to have a lot of line on your rod just to get it over the edge. Yeah. You know what I saw in Austin? A mess. Yeah. People living on oceanfront property without paying for anything. Making a mess. Thank God there's people coming around there cleaning it. I wanted to park and just watch them a little bit. I had one of them crane thingies, you know, and and they was getting them tents and all that junk and putting it in the trash deal. And somebody said, well, I hope the people got out of the tent. And I said, mm. <laughs> just saying, they probably just going to put up another tent. <laughs> But that's my little encouragement before we get started tonight. God's people are everywhere. His kingdom connections, start looking for them. And start being one. The kingdom of God is forcefully advancing, and forceful men lay hold of it. And out in this great United States of America, there's a lot of good folks. You think about the state of New Mexico. There's a few that make a lot of noise because the masses are working, tending to their business, working with their hands, being a burden to no one is what the Bible says. And then you got this handful of empty wagons. You know what the Bible doesn't say, but common sense does? Empty wagons make a lot of noise. But the good news is water runs off a duck. <laughs> so... That's just my little pep talk for the night. We're gonna we're gonna sing a couple of songs. I was, thought I'd talk long enough that Murph would come trotting in here with his guitar, but but that doesn't look like it's gonna happen. We'll sing a couple of songs and I've got some a good word tonight, right out of the book of Acts and about the awakening of Saul of Tarsus and it really is a good word tonight. So uh we'll sing a little bit here and and uh, let me pray we'll get started. Lord Jesus, I just thank you tonight. Thank you for those who came, those who are watching tonight, Lord Jesus. Lord, we know it's not about the numbers. I just pray, I pray for your church, Lord, that the kingdom, your kingdom, and that, God, we would rise up, rise up out of the, out of the muck, the muck of our creating, and we'd rise up and be your people, be known to be your people, that, Lord, through us, you would bring revival to the land. Lord, we would wake up and stand up. God, we would stand for what's right, and we'd claim what is ours. And, God, we know you stand with us, Jesus. And so, Lord, we bless you tonight. Let your word carry your anointing. Equip the saints tonight, Lord. A harvest is plenty. The workers are few. But, God, i got a great group of them right here. Speak to us tonight so we can get out of here tonight and be powerful and be effective in this earth, exposing your kingdom to the whole world. We love you, Lord. We bless you, and we give you praise. In Jesus' name, amen. My band was a little off tonight. I apologize for them, but thank you all for tolerating us. You know, it's just one of them things like the whole time, and I don't know, you know, I don't want to belittle anybody's chance to worship her a little bit, and, and uh, but the whole time I'm sitting there, I'm going, oh, I wish this song get over so I get that Bible open and get up there and do what we, what we came to do. So uh, turn your Bible to Acts chapter 9. I think that's become a little bit of a problem in modern-day Christianity. I think that we like so much of the stuff that it encompasses everything, and then we make time for a little bit of scripture. Make time for a little bit of, little bit of God's word. You know, you can only take so much. Well, you people around here, you know better than that. You all can take the whole load of hay at one setting, and uh, and so that's that's what we come to do tonight. It's a very important story we're going to talk about in Acts chapter nine tonight. 
This is a this is a big deal right here. This is where Saul of Tarsus now becomes the Paul of the Bible. Nine epistles. Words of encouragement for over the last 2,000 years to help the church. Words of instruction to the church. Words of comfort. Words of testimony. Words of example. But more than anything, the words of the Holy Spirit that operated through a man. And it all happened right here in Acts chapter 9 is when it all changed. Every one of you in your life has an Acts chapter 9 somewhere. You should. You know, I don't want to hurt anybody's feelings, but if I ask you when you got born again, you say, well, I grew up in church. So what? I had to live in a garage one time for a while, and it didn't make me a car. <laughs> you know? Uh, there's a day when, when the kingdom of God is revealed. Why is this so important? Because not only is this a story today about one man that God used to change the course of history, but it could be the story of you and your kitchen table. It could be the story of your community. It could be the story of your school. It could be the story of this United States of America on the day when one more time the kingdom is revealed and it changes the landscape forever. So Acts chapter 9, that's why I, was, I wasn't tapping my foot to the music a minute ago. I was just wishing I'd have picked one song so we could get in the Word. Acts chapter 9, let's read a little and see what God says here. Then Saul, and you remember back in chapter 8, you know, he was standing right there when Stephen got stoned, mentioned him in the Bible, and he would, he was, he would beat Christians and murder some of them and and he just, he was mean. But look, he was a high member of the church. Anybody ever known any high members of the church that were mean? <laughs> yeah. Well, Saul, he was that guy. It was because of Jesus. I've met a lot of people who believe that there's a God somewhere, and, and they're not against God, they just don't know God. And then there's people who are so steeped in their religion that they can't handle the truth of the Bible or don't want to conform to the truth of the Bible, and people just keep Jesus. You see, Jesus is the revealer of the kingdom of God. Jesus, the Bible says that God was pleased to have all His fullness dwell in Him. The book of Colossians says that Jesus Christ is the image of the invisible God. So it's all about Jesus. And because of Jesus, Paul went nuts. If it hadn't been for Jesus, Paul would have acted normal. But Jesus stirred things up. Why do you think you got a problem today? Do you think that the troubles in our world today are simply about power and money? If our battle's not against flesh and blood, but against the forces of evil, the principalities of darkness, things in the spiritual realm, then maybe it's about Jesus. Maybe that's where the battle really lies, is in the kingdom of God. I'm just listening to the Lord here just a little bit, but how many of y'all belong to or know of different religious groups that now for decades have developed programs and different things to become palatable to the outside world. Change the music, change the lighting. I may have y'all noticed around here we don't do anything to be palatable except cinnamon rolls. And those just came. Those are a gift from God who came from a little angel over here. And uh, so he's helped us out there. We don't do anything to become palatable. I don't need the world to accept me. The world needs to conform to Jesus. I don't need your acceptance. As long as I'm fine with God... 
I'm fine. And so we see God intervene in a man's life to change the course of everything. But when you when you want to conform to the pattern of the world rather than bring in the reality of Jesus, then you may not be serving God. You may just be an organization that wants to hang out the shingle and fill the coffers and fill the football stadiums or make everybody feel good. How many of y'all believe that I don't work real hard at making y'all feel good? I get up every morning and feel good on my own. I just don't understand why everybody doesn't do that. <laughs> I, I really don't need all y'all to call me anymore to get me to feel good. But I do need to know some truth, and there's a lot of truth in this text. So then Saul, still breathing threats and murder against the disciples of the Lord, went to the high priest. He goes here to get permission to do some more damage. And he asked letters of him for the synagogues of Damascus, so that if he found any who were of the way, with a capital W, whether men or women, he might bring them bound to Jerusalem. So he's getting permission from the high priest to go after followers of Jesus. That's what the way is all about. We don't use the word Christian until two more chapters over here. In chapter 11, the church of Antioch, they begin to, to acknowledge Christianity, the likeness of Christ. But up till now, we were just simply believers and followers of the way. What a nice way to phrase things nowadays. How do you think the conversation goes at Thanksgiving with all your relatives if you just sat up and asked, how many of you are Christians? How many of you think in your families would hold their hands up and say, yes, I'm a Christian? How do you think it'd go if you said, how many of you are followers of the way? Followers of the way. See, that's what Christianity really is. Not believing there is a Jesus, it's being a follower of Jesus. And so, he gets its permission to go do this. You see, I, I, I think that any time, I would think that somebody would walk in here and want to do something stupid because we don't mince words and right's right and wrong's wrong whether you're talking about communist China George Soros gender neutrality radical Islam you want me to keep going down my list of why some jughead would come in here and want to do damage because I can speak like that because of Jesus, because of the Bible, and because of all creation, because of right and because of wrong? Somebody could come in here and breathe murderous threats. Be a really dumb idea on his part, but it could happen. Saul of Tarsus is trying to get permission to go do just that. And so, as he journeyed and came near to Damascus, and suddenly a light shone around him from heaven. Then he fell to the ground, and he heard a voice saying to him, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? And he said, Who are you, Lord? I want you to think about this experience, because I don't know that everybody's had this privilege. But I've been on that road. Mine was I-40, westbound, exit 41. And the appearance of God in my pickup. You know, more or less, same conversation. Hey, dummy, what are you doing? Well, not much. <laughs> you know what happens to people? They have an experience of some kind whether it be at a church camp or, a, or riding in your pickup or whatever your situation is, that day you call on God for whatever reason and you meet Him. And we have been so dull-minded to tell everybody, if you've had that experience, then you're okay. 
That is not the truth. Saul of Tarsus is on his face. He's calling him Lord. There's a great light shining around him. He's done fell to his face. He's calling him Lord and said, Lord, who are you? Jesus is about to reveal himself. But at that moment in time, he is not saved. He just met the Lord. Don't tell me you've met the Lord. Tell me God saved you. Don't tell me you met him one time. Tell me you've been getting to know him ever since. Don't tell me that you believe He exists because you met Him one time. Tell me that you became a follower because you fell on your face prostrate before the living God. When's the last time you heard preaching like that? If we had more of it, we'd have revival in our land. Now we have pupitatism. You know what? I talk about pajama people all the time now. You know the people who just wear their pajamas? Even to Walmart. <laughs> you just want to give them 10 bucks and say, hey, there's some mirrors over if you don't buy one. Apparently you don't have any at your house. <laughs> you wouldn't go outside looking like that. You know who they are. They're the people that want the benefits without doing the work. Well, you know what? I think I'm done throwing stones at them. Because I think I've been preaching to a pile of them around the country for the last 25 years. We want the benefits of God, and we don't want to do the work. Oh, I'm preaching good. Lord, who are you? You see, when you have this experience, you get up different. And you have to follow instructions. You know what's really silly to me today? We got people that believe they got born again and they've never had any instructions. Your next thing ought to be, God, what do I do next? It's awful quiet around here. He said, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? He said, who are you? Then the Lord said, I'm Jesus, whom you're persecuting. Before I do that next line, I want you to think about this. Who was Saul beating up? Who got stoned in a pile? Whose house did he go into? The people's. Followers of the way. Yet Jesus himself said, It's me you're persecuting. I got news for any of you that got something to say about me or you want to get me off the map or you want me to shut up or whatever you're not persecuting me you're persecuting my Lord and Savior Jesus Christ if you think you're man enough for him make yourself at home do what you gotta do cause there's not one of you from communist China on down to any match for the Lord of Lords and the King of Kings, the Creator and the Ruler of the entire universe. And until you get that down in you, you got to get that down in you. If you get that down in you, you don't have to have anybody tail you up in the morning. You don't have to have anybody, you don't have to sing some stupid song off tune about having a fire in my belly or burning or something, I forget, whatever it said up there a while ago. That song ain't going to put a fire in your belly. I'll tell you this word will. The Holy Ghost will. He says, why do you kick against the goads? You know what a goad is? Anybody know what a goad is? Debbie Allen, you're going to love this. It's a cattle prod. Cattle prod with a sticky sticker thing on pointer on the end of it, and you, you they jab the oxen, and if the oxen didn't want to go, they'd kick at it, and if they sold up, you keep sticking them with the stick or poking them with the poker, they'd kick more and stand there and tear stuff up and just kick. I wonder today if Jesus would walk in this room right here or look in that camera and say, why do you kick against the goads? I've been poking you in the butt now for a long time and you won't move. You stand there and kick. 
The only way I can draw you to me is I got to have cinnamon rolls. And he looks at Saul because Saul was a believer. He didn't believe Jesus Christ was the Son of God. But he knew Jehovah existed. He believed the words of Moses. He believed these things. He wasn't an atheist. He wasn't, he wasn't a, a, a non-believer in God. He wasn't like an enemy of God. He was just an enemy of Jesus. Didn't believe that Jesus Christ was the Son of God. And all the things of God began to come against their religion and their way of life. And Saul was a very enthusiastic guy. And he stood for what he believed in. And finally he meets the Lord himself. There's nobody else going to talk him out of this. And Jesus Christ said, Saul, why do you kick against the goats? I've been poking you in the hind end for a while, boy. Why don't you go the right direction? Why do you just stand there and kick why don't you move I wonder what Jesus would say to the church today I wonder what Jesus would say to America today I set you up to be a city on a hill I set you up to be the hands and feet I set you up to be salt and light I set you up with generational purpose I put a foundation under you that nobody can shake yet every time I poked you kicked why do you kick against the goads why don't you just let me nudge you along and move? Why don't you move with me? So then we get all super spiritual, and now we got spirit-filled church services and walks to Emmaus and all kinds of stuff. Good, I'm glad everybody get all get happy for 48 hours. But Dad, come it somewhere in here. You better wake up and have a spirit-led life. And that may not be happy, happy, happy all the time. That may come with God with a pointy stick poking you in the hind end saying, you got two options. You can either move away from the stick or you can stand there and kick. Paul, he says, <laughs> why did Jesus say, why do you kick against God? Why do you rebel against God? Why do we rebel against God? You see, the acceptance of, wor of the world, of the cosmos, and this arrangement we live in is rebellion to God. Gender neutralization is, is, is rebellion to God. Let me tell you something about God. He created genders. He created races. That's in the Bible. That separation of races. It's not racism. These are races created by God. He said, I gave them nations with borders and races, and I ordained their times in Acts 17. God did it. God did it. So take your critical race theory and stuff it in your trash can. Take your gender neutralization and get it out of my face and get it off my TV. Because my God did it one way. And when you can't accept God's way, then you're rebelling to God. It's the truth. And so Saul of Tarsus was the meanest guy in town. He's the most enthusiastic guy in town. And here's another one little old other thing I need to tell you right quick. If you're one of them Sunday morning pew potatoes and Wednesday night and you just want the benefits of God without doing the work, you got so numb to that stick poking you in the butt that you're used to it, and you just stand there anyhow, don't expect God to do anything on your behalf. Yeah, you can quit expecting it. I don't care how many books you read. I don't care until you get up and do this one. I don't care how many praise songs you sing. Till you do this one, till you pray this one, till you move in this one, don't expect much. Some little momentary things. I'm not talking about momentary landmarks. I'm talking about a life led by the Spirit of God as a mere ordinary man or woman. So he says right here, he gives him instructions. Well, now Saul's ready to listen a little. He says, so trembling and astonished, he said, Lord, what do you want me to do? That should be the next line of your encounter with Jesus. You know what that says? 
God, now I want to be a follower. I'll do what you tell me. God, Lord, what do you want me to do? He said, I want you to rise. I want you to go in the city. I want you to, and you'll be told what you must do. And the men who journeyed with him stood speechless, hearing a voice, but seeing no one. See, I'm kind of ready for that to happen at the sail barn. Where everybody can hear God talking to me and not know what's going on. Just, what, you think he's quit doing it? He has for a minute, you know why? Because I don't think any of us believe it'll happen. I believe most of us raised in churches. This is a really good story about Paul. What's the difference between Paul and me? My Bible says that he's never changed. God's never changed. This whole thing's about his relationship with mankind and who he is. My Bible says that God's no respecter of person, so whatever he made available to anybody, he's also made available to me. Yeah. So, why wouldn't a guy who met Jesus in the cab of his pickup at 1 o'clock in the morning, December 3rd, 1995, on his road to Damascus, why wouldn't you just simply believe this? That was the next words out of my mouth. God, what do you want me to do? 25 years later, I've had this amazing, screwed-up life. God, what do you want me to do now? And those guys standing around there, and they're speechless, and Saul rose from the ground, and when his eyes were open, he saw no one. But they led him by the hand and brought him to Damascus in three days without sight, and either ate or drank. Wow. I wonder if Joel Osteen preaches that salvation message. Here, come to the front, get saved. You can be blind for three days. We're not going to give you food or water, and somebody will lead you around by the hand, but you're not going to have any idea where you're going. Now, come to Jesus. Yeah, let's do that one. You know why? Because until you understand the darkness, you won't understand the light. And there's the problem in American religion. They brought you to church, and they turned the lights on, and some of them turned the lights off so you'd get comfortable. But they never did tell you the difference between light and darkness. Walking in the light means you can see and have entered the kingdom of God. Darkness is life outside the kingdom of God. And until the Holy Spirit reveals the kingdom of God to you, until He meets you right where you're at, and takes you out of your darkness into his wonderful light, you have no idea. The darkness is absolutely necessary to embrace the light. Saul, so, guys going to lead you around. Be somebody by to tell you what to do next. You see there's a lot of kingdom connections here. We'll see as we proceed through this Bible over the next week. Lots of kingdom connections. You know how that happened? Because in the second chapter of Acts, the kingdom was exposed. That outpouring of the Holy Spirit, and Peter began to preach the kingdom. There's a kingdom connection coming right here. Now there was a certain disciple at Damascus named Ananias. And to him the Lord said in a vision, Ananias. And he said, Here I am, Lord. So the Lord said to him, Arise and go to the street called Straight and inquire at the house of Judas for one called Saul of Tarsus. For behold, he is praying. And in a vision he has seen a man named Ananias coming in and putting his hands on him so that he might receive his sight. Woo! Oh, Ananias is having a bad hair day right now because everybody knows about Saul of Tarsus. He's having a vision from the Lord. Have you ever had God meet you in the middle of the night and speak your name and you said, Here am I, Lord? Huh? It may be because you never bowed your knee and said, God, what do you want me to do next? You see, in American Christianity, we get in big piles and we beg God to do our everything we need for us. Two times in the Bible it says finished. One was on the seventh day, sixth day. The other one was on the eighth day. One when he finished all creation and one when he finished the kingdom of God and salvation of man. 
And he said, it's finished. So what do we do? We pile up and beg God. Oh, God, you got to fix this. you got to fix this. How many of y'all ever raised a kid that rode a bicycle and kept throwing the chain off his bicycle? Because he wouldn't ride his back pedal or do something all the time, come to you. How about the third time he comes to you with a chain off his bicycle and you say, listen, knucklehead, put your own chain on your bicycle and you'll learn how to quit throwing the chain off your bicycle. That's how we do God, ain't it? Oh, God, I can't get my bike to go. Chains off my bike again, God. Fix my bike, God. Fix this, fix that. I'm not going to go down the list because we can't stand for our crowd to get any smaller, so I'll just leave everybody alone. Come on. It's the truth. God, what do I do next? You hear me talk about strategies a lot. Once you figure out strategies of God and you begin to figure out kingdom connections, you'll actually become very useful in God's earth. You're very usable when you begin to understand some of these things. Here's the kingdom connection. He comes to Ananias in a vision. He says that Saul of Tarsus is going to have a vision. God knows all these things. He said he's going to see you doing this, so I need you to do this because he's going to see you doing this. It wasn't just the visions that were going to work. Somebody had to obey God. Somebody had to make a move. Who's more important in this story today, Saul of Tarsus or Ananias? Ananias. Exactly, because God is going to show Paul Ananias, but God has to tell Ananias, and Ananias has to listen to God to go do what God is showing Saul of Tarsus. And when he gets done, Saul of Tarsus is going to believe because the dream came true, and everything happened just like God said it would. And the next thing you know, he's able to see, and he becomes the author of nine epistles of the Bible that have absolutely changed your life and mine. Ananias is very important. Are you an Ananias? Not everybody's a Paul. Maybe you're an Ananias. Billy Graham had a mom. You know what I mean? He said, then Ananias answered, he said, Lord, I've heard about this guy and how much harm he's done. This looks like a dumb idea. Now, I'm paraphrasing. That's not in there. If you have that in your translation, throw that Bible away. It's not in there like that. But I'm just, I'm just imagining in my own life. I like putting myself in these stories because I've had God come to me in dreams and visions. I've heard His voice. And I've known how scary it is. I mean, I remember a long time ago, one of the, there was a lady that worked with us. And... The Lord told me to pray for her and witness to her. <laughs> she was mean. <laughs> and I was new. <laughs> and I said, oh, Lord, you got to be kidding me. You want to save her? <laughs> yeah. You know what? I did it. I got to pray with her again right before she died. Dang, I'm glad I made my way over there that day. Both times. 20 years ago and a couple years ago. Yeah, but I can feel what he's saying. Lord, that guy, he ain't going to do it. Y'all heard me repent of it right here last week. I had a whole list of people I wouldn't witness to because I thought they were unsavable. You know what? I think I could pray with Nancy Pelosi now. Yeah. Give her a big hug and tell her Jesus loved her and just hold on to her till the Holy Ghost just knocked the wheels right out from under. And then when you get her up off the floor, just say, Hey, Nancy, how do you like my Jesus? What do you think now? Yeah. Got to have that mindset. But I get it, Ananias. He's going, man, I've done heard about this dude. I ain't going, I don't know. But hey, guess what? He does it. And he says, and here, 
And here he has authority from the chief priest to bind all who call on your name. Not only is he a jerk, but he's got permission. But the Lord said to him, Go, for he is a chosen vessel of mine to bear my name before Gentiles, kings, and children of Israel. Here's where I made some of my errors. I've known for a long time that I was chosen by God. I just didn't realize that some of the biggest knotheads in my life could be chosen by him too. Let me repeat that one more time. Because I don't know that that completely sunk in yet. I've known for a long time that I was chosen by God to do some things. But it's been hard for me to believe that some of the knuckleheads in my life could be chosen vessels of God also. You see, you just don't know where all the kingdom connections are. But if you'll go ahead and set your mind that Southern California needs to fall off the edge of the earth, don't do that just yet because I was just there a couple days ago. There's a lot of potential in Southern California. There's a lot of people just like me and you that could be chosen vessels of God. But when I'm too quick to judge, I miss the opportunity for all that because I've heard stories. Here's the other thing. Ananias had never met Saul of Tarsus. You know, one time, a long time ago, I got a group of guys over in a neighboring town. They gathered me up in a little denominational gathering, and they said, we've been praying for you because we've heard you mention Benny Hinn's name several times. Betty Hinn wrote an amazing book on the Holy Spirit one time. Welcome, Holy Spirit, or good morning, Holy Spirit. Good morning, Holy Spirit. Yeah. Oh, I, I'm no doubt that there were some issues along the way. No, no doubt. But the book was really good and very scriptural and very sound. And I could name two more authors. I read their books on the Holy Spirit at the same time, three of them at the same time. Benny Hinn's the only one who got it right. So I mentioned his name, and one of the things that you could go when I was preaching back then, they'd invite me to do revivals because I'm kind of an energetic preacher, and it would make people move around and stuff. And so they'd have me come. And one of the ways I knew where I was at, I'd either tell them I was fixing to speak in tongues or I was going to quote Benny Hinn. <laughs> and you knew right then, <laughs> right where you was at. So they gathered me up, and they said, we've been praying for you because we don't want you to get trapped up by a false prophet like Benny Hinn, and we just don't want to see you fall in that trap, and blah, blah, blah. And I said, man, that's awesome. Y'all been praying for me? Oh, yeah. I said, man, that's cool. I said, man, I've been dying to know about Benny Hinn. I said, so I'm take it some of you have met him. Nope. Really? So you're pretty sure he's a false prophet? Your guy at the front's been lying to you since I got here. Oh, he had me just flat out lying, but he leaves enough stuff out that it's almost a lie. Oh, so you just heard about him, and you guys don't even really know me. So you brought me and him to the same table, and not one of you yahoos knows what you're talking about. Thank you for praying for me. It's a noble gesture. See, I'm preaching me right now. Because I might draw several opinions for myself without ever knowing the person. Just knowing about him. You know, there's a world out there that does the same thing to Jesus. I can listen to you talk for about 15 minutes and I can tell whether you know him or not. Because I do know him. I may not know everybody I draw an opinion about. But I do know him. Well, I can tell if you know him too. You can't tell me that Dusty Leatherwood weighs 145 pounds and is seven, six foot five and has black hair and dances standing up straight. <laughs> <laughs> walks like no horseshoe or 
you can't tell me that Curtis Allen is four foot two and weighs three hundred pounds and handsome. You can't you can't do that. See, I'm making a point here. I know these guys. I know these guys. Do you know Jesus that way? And maybe this tonight will help me to not be so quick on the draw with people I don't know because I'm realizing here as I'm visiting with y'all that I don't choose the vessels. I don't choose the vessels. He says, He is a chosen vessel of mine to bear my name before Gentiles, kings, and the children of Israel. For I will show him how many things he must suffer for my name's sake. How many of y'all have ever read in the Bible about balancing the scales? You see, I need to do a teaching on that one of these days, but we'll do it about three or four days. We'll, we'll stop one of these days and do that because it's necessary for our country, the blood of iniquity, the blood of martyrdom, the balancing of the scales of innocent blood in our soil, and all kinds of things where God balances the scales, and he says, I'm showing him how many things he must suffer for my name's sake. You see, he didn't enlighten Saul of Tarsus so he could be blessed. He enlightened him so he could suffer. Now, how many of you here today have read your Bible at least once and know that the Apostle Paul has changed your life forever by his relationship with Jesus Christ? Do you think another one in the land would be beneficial? Would you like to see another Paul begin to show up on the scene or a man in that same type of representation show up on the scene? Do you think that would be beneficial to the, to the preaching in the land and to revival? How many of y'all believe that? Give me a little head nod. If you think a guy like Paul would be really beneficial nowadays, now how many of you want to be that guy? We'd all like to have one. How many of you want to be one? I don't know why God's had so much mercy on me. Because I do ask him daily, what do you want me to do next? When I read this sentence, it breaks my heart because I should, I should suffer greatly to balance the scales. The things that I've said and done against God in my previous life, the whole time believing there was a God, the whole time knowing the whole trappings of church, yet things came out of my mouth and things came out of my life that totally disgraced God, totally went against God. And there's no way to make it even. So I'm humbled today that I serve the Lord without much suffering. I mean, I'm, 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 I'd understand it if it happened, and we've had our momentary things, but we don't suffer much as American Christians today. Persecution is simply somebody quits coming to church. Oh, he's persecuting me. He's not here. No, the real stuff is when five guys walk in and get you by the nap of the neck, jerk you out in the yard and stomp on your head till you deny Christ. <laughs> yeah. We ought to try some of that on Sunday morning and see how that goes. Suffer much, the balance in the scales. And Ananias went his way, and he entered the house, and laying his hands on him, he said, Brother Saul, the Lord Jesus, who appeared to you on the road as you came has sent me that you may receive your sight and be filled with the Holy Spirit. See, that makes me want to be an Ananias right there. 
show up where you're supposed to be. Put your hands on them. That they could see. I once was lost, but now I'm found. I once was blind, but now I see. Lest a man be born again, he will not enter, nor will he see the kingdom of God. And immediately there fell from his eyes something like scales. And he received his sight at once. And he arose and was baptized. Carrie, can you believe your husband's calling me right now? Curtis, I should answer it. Here, let's do it on speaker. Oh, no, he hung up. He must have heard me. No, I called him earlier, and he just doesn't know what time it is or what day it is. <laughs> That's funny. But, like scales, he received his sight at once, and then he was baptized. I've thought back on that a little bit, and you know we baptized a lot of people. We left the water in the tank tonight just in case there was any leftovers from last week. But here, here's the deal. It took a, a matter of days in obedience. It appears it was just three days here that his eyes were open to be able to see. He obeyed God in baptism, something they already knew about and wanted to be baptized. He had received the Holy Spirit. That's the whole of the salvation experience. It's the beginning of of the saved life and as I've thought back on my own experience how I met Jesus in my cabin my pickup and I asked him what do I do and he tells me a little something I don't know what to do next I drive home I wake up my family we go to church it's Sunday morning because that's what Christians do we didn't know what else to do takes me a day or two before I find my own Bible takes me a day or two before we sat down, and my little Baptist wife knew that I'd got saved. Church I went to didn't even use those words. I didn't know what that was. But here's what I did know. I met the Son of God in the cab of my pickup 25 years ago. I can't draw you a picture of him, but it was him. I heard him I heard him loud and clear. There wasn't anybody else in the truck, so I didn't get to have this thing right here where all my buddies could hear him too. And then over time, I received the Holy Spirit. But honestly, I look back. That moment I met him, but I wasn't a follower yet. And I wasn't born again yet. I've told it wrong. Because I didn't die then and go to hell, so I didn't have another story. But I became a follower. And I got me a Bible, and I snuck around and read my Bible because I'd never seen anybody read their Bible before. So I didn't know, and I read, snuck around and read my Bible. And then funny stuff started happening to me, and the Spirit of God began to come on me, and I kept that a secret for a day or two. And then I had visitation from the Lord. You remember one night, sweetie, we was praying in the bed. We'd land in the bed. Remember when the dog barked? And, and God showed up in our bedroom one night, and we didn't know what the heck was going on. And all this crazy stuff is starting to go on all around us and who do you tell you can't tell them in Sunday school they think you're smoking dope or something what are you supposed to do with yourself but I realized today that I didn't get my ticket ticket punch that day I began a journey that day a journey of getting to know the God who saved me. A God who had came to die for my sins and rose from the grave, who established a kingdom whose footstool is the earth. I began to gradually approach the throne of grace because I didn't even know where it was. So fearful of the presence of God that I would just creep around and sneak around. Things began to happen inside of me and happen all around me that I didn't understand until I read my Bible. I didn't need my Bible to tell me how to act. I needed my Bible to tell me what the heck was going on. 
It was real. Just as real as this story here. And until we begin to preach the realness and the nowness of God, until we allow our neighbors and friends and our fellow man the opportunity of knowing Jesus and having your eyes open and the kingdom exposed, we've missed it. And when you have these momentary whiffs of the Holy Spirit and these moves of God or these different moves in our land that either gets blown up by the gold, the glory of the girls. Till we come to true revival where we become communities who serve God and kitchen tables who serve God and become a nation who serves God. Till we come to this place in our life where you hear the voice of God that says, why do you kick against the goats? Because I'm telling you, everybody in this room has been poked in the butt with the stick of God. And most of us have chosen just to sit down on the stick. Our salvation experience was all, thank you God for forgiving my sins, and we forgot the first line of, God, what do I do next? What do I do? Well, Steve, go to Dusty's house. That one's a real one, isn't it? Where did he tell you to go when he saved you? Guarantee he didn't tell you to go to church. He told you to represent him. These institutions don't create an atmosphere for discipleship, and we have absolutely failed. Because in Matthew 28, when he says, Go make disciples of all nations, baptize them. In the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Ghost. I can't make Sheldon Mason anything. I've tried. I can't make him anything. I can't make Donnie anything. I can't make I can't make you any. I can't make you be anything. That word actually means in the Greek text, it means to create the atmosphere for. You know why we have empty seats here? Because I create every week an atmosphere for discipleship. Don't leave anything out. Everything's full available. I challenge you every time you come in the door and, it, and chewing on what I give you is almost impossible and swallowing almost never happens. Why? Because it's our only hope. It's your only hope for a purpose-filled life. It's our only hope for generational intentionality. It's our only hope of pleasing God. It's our only hope of living under the wing. It's our only hope of enjoying His benefits. And it's our only hope of getting to suffer. Curtis, I'm still looking. We've been talking about it. I don't know if ready for somebody to try me on. Let's Please. Persecute the church. Please, step up. All you little communist Chinamen, quit sneaking around and tainting our underwear or our vaccines or whatever else you do over there and then ship it over here. Somebody just walk up and tell me that you hate Christians. Please, quit sneaking around our schools and quit sneaking around through the deal and manipulating people and getting God kind of easily shoved out of the way. I'm ready for somebody to walk up and drag me out of the building and tell me you don't like me because I know Jesus. And as soon as you get done with me, do every other church in this town and I want to see who stands the test. Let's do that on a walk to Emmaus. Come on, I'm, I'm preaching good tonight. Oh, we're going to pet on you because you're never going to get well. We're going to cuddle you because you just don't feel good. 
Oh, yeah, well, I'm into petting and cuddling, but you know why I'm not a very good pastor, because I don't pet and cuddle very good. I don't need any petting and cuddling. Let me tell you that. I don't need petted on and cuddled on. I'm ready for somebody to challenge my faith. Looks to me like it's the only way you get to write nine epistles. That's the most life-changing son of a gun on the planet other than Jesus Christ himself. Why wouldn't you want to be like him? Why wouldn't you shoot for the top? Paul's the top. Yeah, that road gets really narrow. His life stinks. Yes, glory, hallelujah. I'm going to jail. I'm going to write the Bible left-handed standing in a cesspool. Glory to God. Come on, it's good stuff. Well, guess what? You're getting a taste of it, aren't you, Leon? Yeah. Godlessness has come to Floyd, New Mexico. Godlessness has come to your town. Godlessness has come to your house, and godlessness has come to church. And we just want to be accepted. I mean, I want to be cursed at. You a non-believer? I want my faith to. I want my faith to make you want to throw up. All you enemies of America, all you enemies of God. Come on. Come on. Because that might be the only way the church will ever rise up, you reckon? We done learned we'll take a stand down order. <laughs> yeah, that didn't take long. <sighs> Y'all quit. Y'all just quit now. Y'all behave yourself now. Okay, Master. I ain't doing it. I ain't doing it. We're going to preach this gospel. We're going to do it under the power and the anointing of the Holy Spirit. And we're going to help every one of you do the same. I don't think everybody's got to be a Paul. But how about some Ananiases? That would do good, wouldn't it? Yeah. Hey, once you've had an Ananias come to your house, it's better than Santa Claus. They'll lay hands on you and pray over you and stuff happens. I got an Ananias. Carrie's, Carrie's one of my Ananiases. I told her the other day, she hadn't texted me while I was out on the road very, for about three weeks there. And, and I told her, I said, hey, hey, hey. <laughs> Don't you forget my name around here now. I want to know who's praying. I want to know when people are lifting my name up before the Lord. I want to know when God's speaking my name to somebody. I want to know when somebody's thinking about church tonight. I want to know these kingdom things are going on. Kingdom stuff. Kingdom stuff. So I'm done for tonight. Anybody got anything you want to add to or take away from? Huh? Come on. Did I say something stupid tonight? Please, somebody tell me. I'm going to argue with somebody tonight. <laughs> oh, I'll probably get the chance. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah, that's the only person on the planet I won't talk back to. <clears throat> hey, I, I'm going to lift up some names right quick, and we got some more. But look, uh, Shanna McIntosh, she's got a, a hip deal. Julie Sladen, Valerie Banks, uh, Verl Burris, Linda Stanberry, and Jody Yours. Four of these on here got COVID. I want to I want to tell you something before I pray for COVID, and everybody's dealing with it. Everybody's had to deal with it, and everybody knows somebody's dealing with it. Alan Bounds, his wife, they've been dealing with it. We got people have been dealing with it, and I'm gonna pray over that. But I I told this once, and I need to probably tell it every week. I'm not a doctor, okay? That's probably pretty obvious, but. 
I can hear God. There are things out there in this world that will help your physical body prepare for the battlefield. One of the reasons you're seeing a lot of people lose the battle with COVID is they didn't prepare for the battle before it got here. There's two battlefields with COVID. I don't know enough about the physical battlefield. I know what God has told me, and so I'm very faithful in what I do, and it seems to be working really good so far. There's a spiritual side of this that, that does not get told in the church realm. COVID-19 is a man-made virus. It did not come out of God's ecosystem. Therefore, it's not natural. Therefore, it, it becomes very erratic. How many of you have noticed now in 18 months that it has no consistency in where it lands, how it works, who gets over it, and then your vaccines are the same way. Not telling anybody to or don't, but I'm telling you right now, there's no consistency in the virus. There's no consistency in the vaccine. There's no consistency in the story. There's no consistency in the theory. There's no consistency in the methods. This has no inconsistencies. So this is truth and everything else is not. Okay? Okay? Simple as that. But because it's a man-made virus, they came from the father of all lies because we've been nothing but lied to since he got here. It was set up right out of John 10. It came first to steal, then to kill, and then to destroy. It is right out of the pit of hell from the armies of the devil himself, the communist regime of the Chinese country. That's where it came from. So the spiritual battle here, there's two battlefields. You got to battle this in the spirit. Rob and I have done been through this. You got to battle this in the spirit. I told a family today, we were talking about it, and I said, hey, as dumb as I look, if you live on my road, you've been covered because I get my stick and I hold my stick up according to the Bible. And I claim it and I proclaim it and I rebuke. And now I do my neighbor's houses. I do the same thing up here for all of you that walk in here. I'll lift my hands and wave over, over the congregation or wave over the chairs or wave over your family, wave over my family. Not everybody believes like I do, but I'm trusting my faith to move mountains. I'm trusting my faith to shove that crud in a hole. But if you don't fight the spiritual battle, you do everything in the carnal. You do everything in the flesh then you do not expect victory every time. There's two battlefields for this COVID-19. Whatever variant they come up with, whatever cockamamie story they come up with, there's two battlefields. There's a virus that wars against your flesh, and there's a virus that wars against your spirit. For the life of me, I do not understand why you don't hear this every 15 seconds out of voices that claim to be kingdom voices. Prepare yourself. So when we pray over these COVIDs, you pray over the ones that you have in your family. You pray over your neighbors. 